going on? It's Kevin Kenny. We're coming to you live from the uh, corner of 4th and Broadway here in New York City for the first ever Build All Access. Now, you've probably ever, actually, round of applause for that, first of all. It's going to be a loud build because we're drinking a little bit tonight. This is something like we've never done before. We've got a bar you can't see out in the hallway. We've got drinks in the crowd, and we've got two amazing guests. Julie Mintz has a new record out entitled Abandon All Hope of Fruition, and she's nice enough to bring along her friend Moby. Please give it up for our two guests tonight, guys. Thank you. Thanks for stopping by. Thanks for having us. I didn't get the memo that everyone's having drinks. Neither did I. I know. I'm over here with and water. As someone who's been sober for 10 years, I don't know if this is the best environment for relapse. <laughs> <laughs> Although it would be a weird full circle because there's a balcony up there. And I was telling Julie earlier, this used to be Tower Records. Of course. And the first time I saw one of my records in a record store was that balcony, like 10 feet away. And it was such a big deal because I lived on Mott Street and I walked yeah. over and I was like, a CD single with my name on it. And granted, it was in the most remote, sad part of the store. <laughs> like, I don't think apart from me, anyone ever saw the records in that part of the store. But still, I'm like, oh. So, so if anyone wants to shoot me, that would be like a perfect full circle. Like, I'm <laughs> like very cinematic. Like, I would die just a few feet away from where I first saw my <laughs> CD in the record. So, have at it. Yeah. Well, on that note, speaking of CDs, I haven't seen the physical copies of this guy right here, but I, I wanted to ask, in the liner notes, do you thank The Tonight Show? Because I guess that's really the show that we can thank for this sort of musical kinship, is it not? That's so true. Well, I mean, there aren't really liner notes I know. In, in this day and age, unfortunately. No. But yes, that's... Well, I really, I should just thank, like, neighborhood friendliness, because that's how Moby and I really met. So I moved to L.A., and because I'm bald and small, um, the house that I moved into in L.A. was, like, just complete overcompensation. It was a castle. It was a real um, castle. I was like, it was like, that's how you make up for, like, inadequacy is, like... And I didn't have a driver's license, so I couldn't get a stupid car. And so I had this, this castle, and I had a, a, a housewarming party, and I invited a whole bunch of people, and my friend Russell parked in Julie's driveway because she lived across the street. And she came out to say, excuse me, weirdo, you're parked in my driveway. And he was like, oh, this beautiful woman, I'll invite her to the party. And so that's how we became friends. Like, we lived so close to each other that her Wi-Fi signal was stronger in my house than my Wi-Fi signal. <laughs> Stolen Wi-Fi, that's how this really began. So maybe yeah. put that in the liner notes, Borrowed. too. Borrowed. Yeah. Yeah. What we, I mean, you, you, of course, uh, a nice neighbor is a nice neighbor, but it's an entirely different thing when you ask your nice neighbor to sing backup vocals on something like The Tonight Show, a platform like that. What was it about Julie Moby that really drew you and, and you knew she was special? Well, I mean, I sort of, uh, <laughs> partially it's I really love making music with my friends. I mean, that's why I'm here tonight. That's why we work on music together. Um, I don't, as a musician, I don't feel like I want to prove anything. Like, I'm not trying to, like, advance my career. It's just for the joy of making music. So going on, and also Julie's very talented. Like, if she wasn't talented, I wouldn't say, let's work on music together. But it helps that we're really good friends so we can go out and do stuff and it's just, it's fun. Yeah. More so than like hiring random background singers oh, yeah. where we all sit backstage and look at each other uncomfortably. Yeah. And they tell me about what it's like to sing on a Crest commercial. <laughs> I feel like Moby's really helped me cultivate that fun in music because I can, I have like a little bit of stage fright and I get like kind of anxious about stuff. And so he's always just reminding me like, this is something that is fun and you can do it with your friends and just do it for the love of music and just come out here and play songs because you love doing it. Don't worry about, you know, to be fair, not to make you even more uncomfortable, yes. but you said a little bit of stage fright and you get kind of anxious. Well, I was trying to downplay. You're crippled by stage fright and paralyzed by anxiety. <laughs> yeah, like this, sitting here, how, for how long have you been anxious thinking about doing this? I mean, I've been texting Moby every day, like, I can't wait till this is over, I just wanna go home. <laughs> Yeah, this is, this, this is this is my nice, life right? every day. Yeah, it's like once. Well, I don't know. It'll you be are, more fun when it's over. You're a very nice host. You're with yes, your friend. You got free it water. It's great. It is. I try not to look out there. Yeah. It'll be fun when it's over. By the way, anyone watching on TV, they're probably. I'm guessing about what, fifteen hundred people here. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm going to steal that line for future episodes. You talk about this balance, though, Julia, and I think there's a theme, if you really stop and you look back at both of you two as artists, of a duality in both your lives, and especially the art form of music that you you know, you, you, you gave us here on the record. And the duality I'm talking about is you, people describe you as sort of a bright demeanor, a bright person, right? Maybe soft-spoken at times. But the music is very dark in tone. Mm-hmm. So where does that come from? Um, I think that's definitely like everybody has their sort of mask that they put on when they're out in the world. But then I think I, I definitely have like a darker side to me. And so music's really a good way for me to express that. And you hear that in the songs, you know, it's a lot about like struggling in love relationships and heartbreak. And that's really my outlet for it. Right. It can sort of best be summed up by Julie's high school job. <laughs> so after school, Julie was a cheerleader, but she also worked in a funeral home. Is this true? It's true, so yes. Like, it's, like, it's really just like this perfect image of like you're in your cheerleading costume driving a hearse. It's wow. true, yeah. You got to lead the press release with that I one. know. That's I what was, I said. Like, I, for, I know, I forgot. Uh, I'm glad you no one <laughs> listens to me. Well, I br- this I, old Mr. Middle Age has been over here. Just ignore me. <laughs> Moby's being so kind to himself today on Bill. <laughs> Uh, but there's duality in your own story, which I find so fascinating, because at one point, and I, I think this was at the same time in your life, Moby, you were, by day, leading Bible studies, and then by night, you DJ sex parties. Yeah. <laughs> How the heck do you balance that? Talk about balance. It, well, I mean, yeah. Uh, it made sense to me at the time. I actually I was driving up the West Side Highway today, and I drove by this club, Mars. Well, now it's the Standard Hotel. But it was the first real DJ job I had in New York. And there was a lot of not just duality, like multiple dualities, insofar as that's a thing, where, like, I was this, like, skinny, nervous, straight white kid DJing at a club mainly filled with, like, African-American, Latino, gay, straight, drug addicts, and then, like, DJing at sex parties as well. Um, while also going on, like, Christian retreats and teaching Bible study. My sort of formal Christianity has since fallen by the wayside. Like, now I recognize the universe as being, like, a vast, unknowable, complicated place. But at the time, like, I don't know, like, reading the Bible while eating oatmeal after DJing at a sex party just somehow made sense. Yeah, now that I'm saying it out loud, I realize how absurd that is. To the, to the normal person, you'd probably imagine that the craziest thing you've ever seen at a show happened at a sex party. But, but was it? What is the craziest thing you've ever seen while DJing? There's been a lot of crazy. Like, um, one time I was DJing at a rave, and I got attacked by this huge guy in a tree costume. <laughs> what? Like, he was, like, this uh, out of you nowhere. Know, like music? Like, boom. And the audience thought it was part of the show, but it was just this guy out of his mind on drugs wrestling me, and he was wearing a tree costume. And I was, like, trying to get someone's attention to say, like, this is, no, you might be entertained, but this, I'm actually being hurt by this guy in a tree costume. Um, then one time I remember, I was, the only time I ever played in Lawrence, Kansas. Um... Are we allowed to say words like penis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, good. Talking about sex parties, Moby. So I was playing a rave, Halloween, early 90s. I was all excited because William S. Burroughs was going to be there because it was Lawrence, Kansas. And I run to the front of the stage, and this woman grabbed my pelvis, pulled me forward, and bit my penis super hard. Whoa. And I was like, Wah! <laughs> And after the show, I found her. I was like, what did you do? And she was like, obviously out of her mind on drugs. She was like, I just had to. (laughs) So. It's understandable. Yeah. It's understandable. I think uh, screw getting shot here. I think the way to go out is getting tackled and fought by that guy in the tree outfit. While your penis is being bitten by someone out of her mind on drugs. Yeah, Yeah. while having your penis bought. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the recording process of this record. Is it true that Moby only let you do one vocal take? Um, Yes, he usually does only like me to do one vocal take he's I can be a real perfectionist so it's been really good when I record with him he's like I do it one time and he's like that's it you're done stop I mean you must hate that as an artist I do (laughs) why do that what is the thinking behind that just unfettered sadism (laughs) (laughs) that's what I thought that's actually what I thought um I think I cried in the beginning but but also I'm just used to it what I like in music is authenticity, you know, like, like communicating emotion. And that perfection, like no one wants perfection. Like you don't want to have a relationship with someone who's always perfect. Like if you go on a date with someone, don't you want to go on a date with someone who like is normal and honest and 
open and approachable, not someone who's just like this perfect version of themselves. And it's the same thing for music. And so what I sometimes will do, because I've worked with a lot of singers, is I'll record the first take and say like, just look, just don't worry about it. I'm just getting levels. And then when it's done, I'm like, we're done. Yeah. And they're like, but I have to do it perfectly. I was like, no, like perfection is for like airplanes. Yeah. Like you want your car to be perfect. You don't want emotional expression to be perfect. I like that. I've never heard that, but I really like that. The, um, looking back now though, Julie, on that, do you find your first take to be the most free and honest? It actually, yeah, usually I feel like my first take is the best one. But, I mean, it's nice to know that, like, you could have a second <laughs> chance if you needed it. But just go in with Moby knowing there aren't really second chances. Well, uh, Same for life. Yeah. Well, it yeah. prepares you for live moments like this, right? There's yeah. no net. Whatever happens, sure. happens. Moby gets shot upstairs. Who knows? Uh, there's another theme that sort of emerges between you guys. <laughs> that was a joke, by the way. Uh, <laughs> nothing's going to happen to Moby. Uh, but another theme that I, I, th I thought about when I was considering the record and then just knowing your story, Moby, is the, trying to force things that are out of your control. You talked about, uh, Julie, on this record, it's a lot about relationships and, and wanting to be in love so badly. And then, you know, Moby, you, you were talking to Larry King recently about the years after play and just wanting things to be as big as that record and it just being totally out of your control for so many different uh, variables. I want to talk about both those things, but first, just that notion of wanting to be in love. What, what do you think made you want to be in love so bad, Julie? Well, I mean, I, I feel like that's, a, that's like a natural inclination that we're all wired to have. Like, we all want to be in love, but that's the reason that I titled the album Abandon All Hope of Fruition because I was writing all of these songs about this like deep want. And um, it's actually based on a Buddhist saying by Pema Chodron. So the idea is if you can abandon all hope of fruition, if you can let go of this future hope that you have for things you think you need in order to be happy, like if you could just say, maybe I'm gonna spend the rest of my life and I'll never be in love again from this day forward and could I be okay and I could I just appreciate the things I have right now? Um, and that was kind of a theme that I was exploring in my songs. So wow. that's that's where the title comes from. It's really hard, it's a hard concept I think to practice but makes you appreciate the things you have. No, and I think it's a concept a lot of people, a lot of fans can relate to. Is there a song, a track on the album that maybe is like the epicenter of that sentiment or notion? Um, yeah, I mean a song that we're gonna play tonight is called Want to Feel Wanted. Okay. And that's really a big one, just, you know, just like being out there in relationships and just like that deep want. And it's, I think it's really hard as humans to ever get rid of it, but to just, I don't know, know that maybe we don't need to have it to be happy. Yeah, yeah. I want to uh, get back to what I was saying before uh, quickly about your conversation. It was a great conversation with Larry King, and you were being honest about it. You know, it was frustrating you because seemingly uh, it was just every following record just didn't, for whatever reason, didn't come out as commercially successful as play. We were talking before we went live here about Billy Corgan and Smashing Pumpkins. He's been on the record talking about how the years after Melancholy, like he didn't feel like anything changed. Culture just happened to move on, right? And I think that's something that's it's hard as an artist that has huge commercial success as you did. How did you sort of tackle that? Um, I drank a lot. Okay. And <laughs> slept around and yelled at publicists when things didn't go my way, um, discovered cocaine. Okay. Uh, so you tried to numb it? All, I just tried to basically, like, essentially, like, when, when commercial success was, when excessive commercial success was happening, the world was my drug. And as it started to wane, as reviews got bad, as album sales went down, I essentially took over my neurochemistry with alcohol, drugs, promiscuity, degeneracy, narcissism, entitlement, self-involvement. And then I bottomed out, got sober on First Avenue. And, uh, but there's a subtext to this, and sort of like of that quote as well, is we all assume that if we get the thing that we want, we'll be happy. The thing is, there's absolutely no evidence for that to ever be the case. Like if it was, Kurt Cobain would be alive, and Heath Ledger would be here, and Ernest Hemingway would have lived to a ripe old age, et cetera, et cetera. So Michael Jackson would be putting out his new record. You know, like, yeah. basically, you get what you want, and you're still out of sorts. You're still miserable. And, and so there's an acceptance that comes with sort of saying to yourself, like, oh, lots of times I got what I wanted, and it made me miserable. 
And there were times where I didn't get what I wanted, and I was actually quite a lot happier. So I'm not omniscient, you know, I'm not God, so I don't know actually what has the capacity to deliver true lasting happiness. And I think that's true for every human or possibly every organism. Yeah. Not to get too esoteric and rambly. No, we rarely talk about organisms on the show, so this is kind of okay. great. <laughs> Uh, thinking about collaborations here, got me thinking about past collaborations of yours, Moby. And I don't think you've ever, I've never heard you tell this story, but it's one I've always wanted to ask you about. When you linked up with Gwen Stefani on Southside, which is one of my favorite mm -hmm. songs. By the way, not on streaming, though, very frustratingly. It isn't? No. Oh, I don't know what sorry. that's about. But That's weird. But uh, the, uh, the story that I've heard uh, from people is that you actually had Gwen do that, cut that record, and then kind of didn't do anything with it for whatever reason for like a year or two, mm -hmm. and then remixed it, and that's when you guys shot the video and became this big song. So what was the story of well, that record? Because when the album Play came out, I was a has-been. Like, I had, I had already been dropped by my record label. There was V2 Records, which is actually just over there. I'm pointing there. Um, and V2 released Play sort of out of charity. They were like, oh, this is a pretty good record. No expectation. So I didn't put the song with Gwen on there because it just seemed like too much effort. And then the album started to do well, and someone at V2 said, wait, you have a song, uh, like a pop song with Gwen Stefani on your record, and it's not on the record? And I was like, yeah, I guess we forgot to put it on there. So it was just like just stupidity and oversight on my part. And then we put it on there, and we made this a video that was way too expensive but did well. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, but I mean, over the years, collaborating has been really interesting because I worked with everyone from Metallica to David Bowie to Michael Jackson to Gwen to... I mean, I remixed and produced Freddie Mercury posthumously. That was really interesting, being sent master tapes. So, like, being with Freddie Mercury in the studio after he died, like, that was pretty odd and interesting and macabre in a way. Yeah. But, like, when you collaborate with people, what you realize is, like everybody's uncomfortable and everybody's human. So that's the one thing I'll say, because in the course of my life, like I've met a lot of very famous people, a lot of very successful people, no one is exempt from the human condition. In fact, the more famous someone is, the more scared and insecure they are. Like the most insecure, brittle people I've ever met tend to be the most famous, successful ones. Yeah. Well, there's a, I think there's a paranoia that comes along with that that probably leads to that fragility. Uh, but talking about all those collaborations, of course, now, Julie being the latest collaboration, before we get to the uh, questions from Twitter and then also those in the audience, you're doing something really cool on Friday night. You're doing a birthday show. Yes. This is like the coolest way to celebrate your birthday. What's yeah, going on? I know. You only, you only turned 29 once. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's uh, nice they didn't laugh. I know. <laughs> um, I'm, yes, I'm playing a show um, at the Crown Rooftop at the 50 Bowery Hotel. Um, yeah, I'm excited. I've never played a birthday show before, but I feel like that's a good way to celebrate. Yeah, so I was going to ask, as an artist, it's got to be like the best way to celebrate, right? Yeah. It's really cool. Uh, Except that you hate performing and you get terrified. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, well, it'll be that. an anxious birthday. But they're going to give like lots of free champagne, so that'll help. There you go. Yeah. You'll match with some of our guests here tonight that are drinking and enjoying themselves. Uh, we're going to get to those questions in just a second, but first let's go to Twitter. This comes from at KitKat3472. Uh, this is for Julie. What is the most important thing you've learned from Moby about creating music? Oh, I've definitely, the most important thing I've learned is, um, well, I think we touched on it tonight, that it's just, it's um, about making music that, um, you feel emotional about because if it touches you, it will touch other people. So that's really the only thing that matters when you're making music. Right. And if you're really lucky, a guy in a tree suit will touch you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it is, it is true. Let's get to the uh, studio audience questions. The first one will come from... A person, I promise. Okay, I guess I'll, I'll oh, there you first go. question. You know uh, hi, Moby. I've been a fan of yours for a long time. When are you coming out with a new album? That's a good question. So at this point, um, as a 53-year-old man who refuses to tour, I don't expect to make money from music. I, I don't read reviews. So I, I have no commercial expectations for music. So when I make records, it's just for the love of making them. And also, I'm structuring my entire professional life as paradoxical as this might sound, so I can't make money from it. Like, all my music now, if money comes in, I give it to animal rights organizations because that's more important to me than self-promotion or, you know, having a, a career or whatever stupid things you do with money. So maybe I'll put out a record 
I don't know. I'm putting out a new book, another memoir in May. It's so dark. It's so dark, my publisher has actually questioned me a few times if I want to release it. Like, <laughs> it's like suicide attempts. We get to hear about sex parties, right? Yeah, there's, some, there's a lot of that. It's, but it gets real. It, Trump is in it. Putin's in it. It's, it's just a weird book. So <laughs> I'll just keep putting out music. And I, so I wish I had a better answer to your question. I don't know. Does this pick up where the last book left off? Because the last one left off like at play, I think, right? This is childhood and then post play. And it's all like childhood trauma and then like the things we do in adulthood to try and fix childhood trauma, which not surprisingly don't work. And then bottoming out. And like the spoiler alert is at the end of the book, I get sober. Right. <laughs> Let's get to the uh, second studio audience question. Come from over here. Hi, Julie. I'm Moby. Um, <laughs> I follow you both on Instagram, so I'm like super happy to do so. And I loved your Joshua Tree photo shoot recently. It was super cool, Julie. Thanks. Um, yeah, but for Moby, um, I just wanted to know, I've heard you say speak so articulately about how you moved from New York to LA, but I just wanted to hear in person basically why you did so and uh, the differences and just, again, the reasons why. Well, it's funny. So as I might have mentioned a few times, because um, I repeat myself because I'm old, uh, I got sober and... The day I got sober, I realized New York is the world's best place to be a drunk. For any of you who live here who are drunks, like you know what I mean. Like you stumble around the Lower East Side at 3.50 in the morning and then end up on someone's rooftop doing drugs and like talking about spirituality at seven o'clock with someone you've just met and it's great. But then I got sober and I was like, oh, New York is kind of a rough place to be sober. And so LA, I had criteria of like, where can I be warm in the winter, have easy access to nature, um, be around creative weirdos, and live down the street from David Lynch. <laughs> so it was pretty specific criteria. And then luckily, so I moved, as I said, to my like overcompensating castle. And really one of the best things that came from it was meeting Julie and becoming friends, because we're like best friends. We've worked on so many weird creative things together. And... I mean, really, like, Julie, I know she's beautiful. You know, there's a golden, sun-kissed California child who actually worked in a mortuary and was a neuroscientist. But she's also up for everything. Like, I had this idea of taking... I wanted to invent a fake cult. So I got all these weird masks and put my friends in masks. And I was like, wow, it'd be great if I had, like, pictures of, like, a naked person sort of, like, drowned in my pool wearing one of these cult masks. And Julie was like, I'll do it. So, like, she takes off her clothes puts on a monkey mask and pretends to be this drowned lady at the bottom of my pool. So like there's, Turns out there's it was weirdness like, and darkness here that she's just not sharing. It was right like now. being waterboarded, actually. Yeah, the, like being underwater and pretending to be drowned wearing like a rubber mask, like that's a degree of like courage that I don't have. <laughs> Gotta make it out to this castle. Yeah. Well the castle I sold it. Oh really? Yeah. Uh, can you explain how, can you explain, is that true? You sold your castle to Banksy? Sure, why not? All right. Yeah. <laughs> it's out there now. Can you explain how New York City is uh, like Donald Sutherland? New York so, City is like Donald yeah, Sutherland? Yeah, you compared New York City to Don Donald Sutherland in, uh, in some interview. I actually think I was misquoted. At one point I was talking about... No, you were about, on video. Like you were saying. Then I was, <laughs> was I... Maybe I was misquoting myself. You're, Donald Sutherland... You were saying it was like Donald Sutherland in uh, Body Snatchers. Oh, now I know what you're talking about because I was thinking of like Donald Sutherland in like Animal House. Cause, um, so Donald Sutherland, there are people outside. Oh, no, they're not. It's a reflection of these people. Sorry. Um, I'm sure there are, though. I'm There's sure. like some weird ghost audience outside. <laughs> Gotta go burn sage. Um, so Invasion of the Body Snatchers. The Body Snatchers take over people's body, thus the title, Body Snatching. So, like, New York, I grew up here, and it was, like, this land of, like, degeneracy and weirdness, and now it, like, is the same streets, the same buildings, but it's become very corporate. I still love it, but you have to admit, like, it's, it's a very different place for anyone who was here in, like, the 70s, the 80s, 90s. Like, it's a real different place. So, I think that's what I meant yeah, by Donald Sutherland. Sense. Okay. Well, you can't pay. I heard you paid 50 bucks. To some dude to live in a factory? My, f my first home, well, it was actually yeah. in Connecticut. It was an abandoned factory. In oh, that was in Connecticut? Okay. My first loft here, I paid $400 a month for, like, this big, beautiful loft. And we had so many weird musicians, like Iggy Pop and the Beastie Boys and Sean Lennon and Helmet and Sonic Youth were all in the building. 
Wow. Um, it was really, really interesting. It's quite the pad. We have uh, time for one final question here before you guys perform. It'll come from right over here. Hi, Moby. Hi, Julie. How are you doing? Hi. Um, this question's uh, directed to you, Moby. Um, I want to know, do you consider what you're doing musically um, the same as the EDM culture that's out right now? And where do you see the genre going? Uh, I mean, I, as, as vague as this might sound, I, I just love playing music. That's so vague. It's like, you know that scene in I'm Almost Famous where Russell is on the roof and he's going to kill himself and he's like, my last words, I love music. <laughs> and I'm high. Luckily I'm not. Um, but it's that I love music regardless of genre, regardless of whether it's electronic or what we're doing, like acoustic and very stripped down, like whether it's classical music, whether it's punk rock. And so electronic dance music or dance music in general it's just a facet of music. It's a way in which people communicate with each other and can feel that sense of connection. So I try not to get too concerned about genre labeling. Um, it is weird when like the socioeconomics of EDM culture where you have like 19 year old Dutch kids with private planes because they had one single, like good for them, but that's weird. <laughs> Julie, do you think about genre with your music? Um, well, I do in the sense that people ask me what my style of music is. Um, and and I think it's really exciting to see like people like Casey Musgraves and Marin Morris that are doing kind of like left of center country music because I feel like my music has some country influences and I love pedal steel. So um, I definitely think about it, but I also love all kinds of music and grew up right. listening to like Joni Mitchell and a lot of classic country. And then obviously I perform with Moby. So that's a whole other genre. So yeah. yeah, I think there's so many kinds of music I love. Definitely. And all comes through on the new record, which is out and available now. Again, uh, Friday night, birthday show right here in New York City. So if you're joining us live, check those out, uh, check that out, I should say. And where can we, are there tickets still available to that? Is that like a private event? Like, how's that going now? Um, yes, you can RSVP. Uh, it's on my Instagram. Okay. It's Julie Mintz. Nice. Um, and then I think it's open to the public. It's the Crown Rooftop Bar All at right. the Hotel 50 Bowery. And it has the most remarkable views of New York I've ever seen. And are you going to be there, Moby? No, I'm going to be back. I'm going back to LA tomorrow. Back to the, oh, not the Just, I'm gonna. I need to spend Valentine's Day with myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Valentine's Day attachment issues. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you so much again for stopping by. Round of applause. They're going to be hanging out, performing. If you're with us live on buildseries.com, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. <laughs> 